All right, hello everybody, and thank you for tuning back into our Telequarium programming. Today, you are in for a treat. We are here at our touch tank, and we are going to be doing a feed. My name is Haley, and I'm part of our education team here, and I'm joined by Leo, our aquarist, and he's going to be telling us all about the awesome touch tank animals we have here. Take it away, Leo. All right, so Haley just mentioned aquarist. Um, what is an aquarist? It's exactly, they would look like uh, me or another person, but it generally refers to people that works at an aquarium and takes care of all the fish and invertebrates. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm really excited to talk about this, um, the touch tank because number one, it's got all the, uh, the invertebrates and crustaceans or the creepy crawlies that I like to call them. And two, you get to touch them. So uh, follow me this way and uh, we'll get to say, uh, say hi to all my friends. But if, oh, and it's really important that we feed them. That's what we're doing today. But speaking of forgetting, um, it seems like a lot of people, when they come to the touch tank and they want to touch something, they, uh, the first thing that they touch is usually the water. And they say, ooh, that's really cold. And that's because they're relatively true. Um, so the water temperature right now, well, I don't know about right now, but according to the log that I checked, earlier today, it was 4.6 degrees Celsius, which is about 40 degrees. So that's pretty chilly. Um, but what's really cool about this tank and the fact that you could touch it is that um, it's actually the ocean. So we have a, our aquarium is a open system, which means that all of our water is pulled from the ocean. So underneath this building is a big well. And from this well is a pipe that goes 700 feet out into the ocean, 260 feet down, and all the water goes into the pipe, up the pipe, into the well, and then from the well, it gets pumped all through our aquarium, including this tank. So we have literally pushed and pulled the ocean so we can touch it right here. It's really cool uh, when you think about it. Um, so, forgetting not to forget to feed the animals. So, um, one of my favorite things to feed uh, as a kid was sea anemones, and I'm really stoked that I get to do that as an adult. Um, so, today we have some chopped up silver sides. Da -da -da. Very yummy. Um, and we'll feed some crimson anemones. Da -da -da. So, anemones are related to jellyfish, they are both cnidarians. And so, uh, if you imagine in your heads what a jellyfish would look like floating out in the open ocean, they're like, meh. I don't know if you can see my hand. Um, but an anemone is basically a jellyfish upside down that's stuck to the ground and growing like that. So uh, this is kind of, in a way, the underside of the jellyfish. Um, and so these are all of its tentacles coming out from the center. And in the center of the center is its mouth. Um, so you can't really see it actively moving right now. Maybe it's not as hungry as I thought. Um, oh, you see like a tentacle crawling. But uh, yeah, so they will um, use the tentacles the same way as jellyfish and kind of bring all their uh, tentacles towards their mouth and that's, where, that's how they eat. Um, and uh, the mechanisms in the wild, here, you know, most of the fish or all the things that we feed them are dead, so they don't really have to struggle to put them into their mouth. But in the wild, sometimes they are actual living creatures that they have to struggle and battle to, uh, to actually eat. Um, and so for that, they have uh, these things called nematocysts, which are the same type of stinging cells as jellyfish have. Um, but, you know, we have these stinging creatures in our touch tank, and we have people touching them. How is that possible? How is that safe? Uh, it's actually totally safe. I have here, here's a, a hand, and I can touch them right now. And you can kind of see them gripping on. They actually feel a little bit sticky. And that's the nematocysts uh, firing. And it is trying to sting me, but my skin is so thick that it can't actually penetrate my skin. So all I feel is a little bit of stickiness when they're trying to uh, basically eat me. But it's not going to work. Um, so anemones are really cool. Another really awesome thing that anemones do is the way they reproduce is wild. Um, so this is, you know, anemones in general, but they can do sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction, internal fertilization, external fertilization. They have all sorts of 
sequential hermaphrodites and blah, blah, blah. So, for, so, okay, so for example, um, there is an anemone called a brooding anemone, and they um, are a sequential hermaphrodite, which means that they eventually change sexes sometime over through their life. And so these guys will, uh, brooding anemones will start off female and then eventually turn into a female male, like a simultaneous hermaphrodite. And there are some cases where the simultaneous hermaphrodite will uh, fertilize itself and the little tiny anemones will crawl out of its mouth and then fall down the side of the anemone where it lands at the foot of the anemone and it'll grow until it's a independent and you know uh, anemone that can live out into its, uh, live out its life in the own world and it'll crawl away at the age of three months they grow up so fast um, so yeah that's like all the cool things about anemones. Um, here we have a, something really new, actually. I didn't see this until I came in this morning. Uh, we have some green urchins and all that like, layer of cloud above the rocks. That's actually them um, uh, broadcast, broadcasting uh, their sperm and eggs. And so that's kind of cool. That, that you don't get to see that every day. Um, and for urchins, what triggers that is um, like a certain amount of light versus dark ratio as well as uh, temperature and it's more of like a seasonal thing and uh, there there's these those two factors that tell in, uh, urchins to hey like now's the great time to reproduce and so they'll uh, broadcast all their eggs and sperm into the water column and out in the open ocean they'll all mix around and float around until they land on the ground and they turn into little urchins and start their crawly lives here it just seems like they've settled right there um, urchins are really cool. I think they're one of my favorite animals, actually. Um, on the outside, they mainly consist of tube feet, spines, and tiny little claws called pedicellarias. So when you first look at an urchin, uh, it's kind of evil looking. If, you know, if, if the uh, evil creatures existed, this is what I would have imagined. But they're actually really gentle. And for the most part, they're kind of like a vegetarian. They mostly eat algae, although they are sometimes like opportunistic scavengers where they eat dead fish and dead invertebrates and stuff. But for the most part, they just eat algae. And actually, let's see if, can, are we able to look mm -hmm. at the spines? Mm -hmm. So what we do here at the aquarium is we call it an urchin hug, but we can actually put our finger right to the urchin. And if you wiggle your finger around, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. They'll actually give you a gentle hug. And we call it our urchin hug. Um, so it's kind of cute from our perspective, but from the urchin's perspective, it's actually terrified. And he, the urchin thinks that it's being attacked by a predator, for example, like a, like a sea otter. And in defense, it puts all of its spines up uh, to protect itself. Now, purple urchins, they've got really you know, pointy spines and they could defend themselves pretty well. Whereas the green urchin, their spines are more so as like, a, they kind of look like dinosaur arms to me. They're really short and they don't function as well. And so uh, what they're able to do is, if you look over here, uh, if you could see, there's uh, a couple of urchins with rocks on their heads. And to me, they always look like little party hats. But it actually serves a functional purpose. Um, they will put rocks on top of their heads uh, in order to protect themselves from otters as well as camouflage so they can blend into the background and hopefully they just not seen to begin with. Um, but how do they do that? And how are they sticking on the glass? And how do they move around? That's all great questions. Um, they actually have tube feet. So one of my favorite parts about the urchin, it's really hard to tell, but maybe you can. Oh, there's hundreds of little tiny tube feet protruding all from its a body. And that's kind of more of, functions more or less like a straw. Um, so they have what uh, we call a water vascular system. And so they're able to uh, suck in water and not suck in water. And that's how they're able to move around, stick on the side of the glass, um, and put party hats on their heads. Um, and uh, that's actually the same mechanisms 
as the underside of a sea star. If you've ever seen one, they look like they are lined and covered with tiny little mushrooms, and those mushrooms are also tube feet. So what's kind of interesting is sea stars, uh, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, which I haven't talked about, um, and uh, sand dollars, they're actually all related. So uh, if you take a sea star and you bound all the arms and legs together into a disc, that would be a sand dollar. And if you blew up this sand dollar, that's a sea biscuit. We don't have any sea biscuits here, but if you gave the sea biscuits a bunch of spikes, that's a sea urchin. Uh, you take the spikes off, and then you elongate it, make it really floppy, that is a sea cucumber. So it's kind of weird, but they're actually all related. And one of the main uh, points, uh, on one of the commonalities is uh, they are pentaradial. So their internal structure is divided into five. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really, interesting way nature has kind of evolved and taken different kinds of expressions. Um, so sea cucumbers, that's another, uh, another cool thing to look at. This is a sea cucumber, a California sea cucumber. Ta -da. This one also looks spiky and kind of aggressive, um, but it's not at all. They're actually kind of like the janitors of the sea and they're really soft. Not because that, that they're the janitors of the sea, um, but they're the janitors of the sea because they kind of eat all the dead things, they eat all the um, like waste of an other animals, and they poop out sand. Um, they're, it's, it's interesting, but what they poop is actually probably cleaner than what they eat. Uh, they're what we call like decomposers or scavengers, and they just go around and look for dead things on the ground. And that's a day in the life of a sea cucumber. Now that I've talked more about it, I don't think it really resembles a janitor in any way. <laughs> um, let's see. All right, so here we have a hairy triton. Hairy tritons are pretty cool. Um, they're a snail, and I really like them. I got to know them a little better because they laid eggs a while ago. Uh, are we able to move over here? Yeah, I can get down uh, oh. at the window. Just give me a second. Okay. Maybe I could get a better view this way. So, I don't know if you can see. Perfect. All right, so those are hairy triton eggs. Um, and lots of fun facts about those, but at this stage of their life, each snail will lay like hundreds of egg sacs, and within each sac, they will have thousands of embryos. And these embryos will come out of their egg sacs over the course of weeks. And uh, you can see maybe some of them are kind of clear, whereas some of them are a little bit opaque. Um, and the opaque ones are the left, like the, like the last remaining embryos, and all the other ones are uh, uh, just the clear egg sacs. And those egg, uh, embryos will come out of their eggshells and float around in the water column for about four and a half years or until they find like a suitable home where they settle and then they kind of take shape of a more familiar snail and crawl away and live out their lives. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, there's another fun fact about sea cucumbers that I totally forgot. Um, I'm putting, through, putting the cameraman through a hard time. <laughs> um, but sea cucumbers, they have an amazing defense system. So. Uh, they have two mechanisms of defense. So the first one is ballooning, which uh, I've never actually seen these guys do. But uh, when, I went, when I go scuba diving, I'll find sea cucumbers that are like ridiculously large. And when I poke at them, they will inflate themselves into this gigantic football. And uh, that, the logic behind that is that if I'm too big to be swallowed, then I'm probably okay. So they'll just inflate themselves into a gigantic balloon. And then, if you keep on agitating them, they'll actually do this thing called evisceration, which means that they will poop their uh, guts out. <laughs> and so uh, I think the logic behind that is they're hoping that whatever predator is trying to eat them will get distracted by this funfetti of guts and organs and go after that while the sea cucumber slowly crawls away from the predator. And uh, eventually, 
uh, this, the sea cucumber will regrow its organs and carry on its merry way. Um, and hopefully, at that time, there's no pearl fish because pearl fish love to live exactly where they poop. They like live inside the little like butt, basically. And uh, so th there's like a there's another fun fact about pearl fish and the, their symbiotic relationship. Um, let's see. Oh, are we able to show the scumboo chitin? If not, it's okay. Uh, there's one over there. Oh, yes. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, gumbu chitons. I'm sorry, I didn't realize how far apart this uh, all the animals would be. <laughs> gumbu chitons are really cool. They're the gentle giants. They're actually the world's biggest uh, chitin. So chitons are kind of like a mix between a snail and a roly-poly, and it's like a snail or a slug and a roly-poly. So they're invertebrates and they, uh, that have these eight different shells on their backs, and. Uh, that's how they usually crawl around, but these guys uh, are a little different because they have what we call a girdle, and they, it's like they're part of their skin that covers all of their eight plates, so you can't actually see the plates. But um, yeah, they're gigantic uh, kinds that get about the size of like a sandwich, basically, like maybe about like that big, like 13 inches or so. And uh, they prefer to eat uh, red algae, but they'll just eat algae. They like kind of gently roam around, and um, they have that like red, like red color and that thick, tough, leathery skin. Hence the name Gumbu Chitin. Um, but uh, tide pool connoisseurs uh, will call them. Um, I've heard them called what was it? Uh, wandering meatloafs. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, yeah. So okay. Um, oh, so working here at the Touch Tank. I always find something new every day. And re uh, fairly recently, I found this adorable, tiny little baby crab, which is actually not a baby. It's called a pygmy crab, and it's right here. It's a Maybe I could put it in my hand if I'm being gentle enough. Hello. This is a pygmy crab. And that is how big it gets. And I think that's so adorable. Hello. Oh, just kidding. So yeah, that's a pygmy crab. Uh, wait, how much more time? Wait, is that how much more time do I have? Uh, well, you're, you're pretty good. Yeah, if you just want to talk about anything in here, or let's just feed as you would. Okay. You Great. Okay, so <laughs> normally I would uh, feed like this, um, but it's not as uh, eventful as you might expect because these guys are like. You know, scavengers, bottom feeders, they kind of slowly cruise around, and once they find a food, they'll nibble on it. Nothing crazy like salmon feeding. Um, but, uh, okay, so there's another story I want to talk about. It's about hermit crabs. Okay, cool, awesome. So, uh, when I, uh, I did, I was helping a friend do a study about hermit crabs. And so, by the name, you'd guess hermit crabs are pretty antisocial, but actually, they're really, really social. And in truth, they're really mean to each other. So uh, in here, we have you know, a limited number of crabs, and we can get all the shells we can get from the wild. So there's no, not much of a problem. But in the wild, there's lots of crabs and not very many shells, basically their own version of a housing crisis. And so these crabs are pretty competitive about who gets the best shell. And it's challenging because crabs are always growing, and so the demands are always changing. And so uh, for the study, we wanted to see like, what is the behavior, what is the relationship between these two crabs and these two snail shells. And uh, so we set up a tank and we went out and collected a bunch of hermit crabs, plopped them in the tank, and for decoration and kind of enrichment, we uh, had this little rock in the middle of the tank. And what we discovered that was not part of the uh, part of the project was that the hermit crabs love to be at the top of the rock, but they only want, they wanted to be the only hermit crab at the top of the rock. So one hermit crab would crawl, climb to the top and claim victory. And then another hermit crab will crawl up from the back and then like sucker punch him in the back and the other hermit crab will go tumbling down and then the next hermit crab will claim like the king of the rock. And then another hermit crab will climb up from the back and sucker punch him off the rock. And this happened so many times. 
and it's ridiculous. I don't know why they do that. But um, on the more like, you know, research-related uh, side of the story, um, we found this one big hermit crab that saw this little hermit crab shell. And the, little, uh, the big hermit crab was interested in the little hermit crab shell. So uh, he like, crawled up and started to like, pull the little hermit crab out of his own shell. And like, no, but you know, it was part of research. We, we, can't really, we, could, only, only, we could only watch. And uh, the big hermit crab eventually actually pulls the whole hermit, little hermit crab out of his shell. And so this you know, little hermit crab is outside of his shell with his little peanut body. And the big hermit crab checks out the little hermit crab's shell and then decides that his shell is better, so it goes back, but then holds onto the little hermit crab's shell. And so the her little hermit crab ended up having to walk away and look for another shell. Like, that's, that's so cruel. That's so mean. I don't know. But that was, that was their fate in that moment. And uh, I've seen, actually, hermit crabs in this tank fight over each other's shells. So um, they're fairly social, a little bit... Uh, meaner than I expected, but I still find them adorable.